We knew we needed a new facility. We had outgrown ours. It was very um, at risk from earthquakes, other major disasters. It was antiquated. It wasn't a healthy working environment. But it was time to break the mold and actually address a problem that's been creeping up in the fire service. Actually, two problems. First and foremost is firefighter health and safety. The health side of things from cancer. Uh, we lose three times the number of firefighters from cancer a year that we do line of duty deaths. So, so that's a real issue that needs to be addressed. And while we're talking about it, we're not taking active steps to truly fix it. So, and the second thing is, is mental health for firefighters. Obviously, post-traumatic stress disorders, suicide rates, things like that are of high concern for many occupations. But the fire service is not immune to that. So we wanted to create an environment that felt healthy to people, gave them mental health, physical health, so that we could in turn serve the public from a healthy standpoint in a very proactive way. To accomplish that, we really had to just sit back and say, okay, what are our root problems that we need to address? And when we identified what those problems were, we just went all around the world to look at best practices of how can we incorporate science, known information, into this facility and do it right once the first time. And that's the creation of this fire station. Fire service is something that all of us need. The, these guys don't just come and put your house out when it's on fire. They come for medical car accidents, they are responding to all kinds of different emergency situations. And honestly, we're in a position now where we need more of these stations just stationed around the valley. Well, the fire station that they left behind was in very bad shape and they were in need of a lot of things to really be able to do the work that they needed to do. Their old facility was antiquated, out of date, out of current seismic requirements and unsafe to use not to mention overall about two bays short of being really usable for their actual responses. So the goal was to build a new station that would house all of their equipment and all of their personnel at one time. It's crazy, you know, thinking all the way back to when it was uh, college town when I went to school here and uh, it was basically a cow town. I grew up in Bozeman and really the growth here started probably in the 90s but the last 10 or 15 years, it has just been next level growth. And if you look at building permits, Belgrade itself a year ago was the fastest growing municipality in the country. Any improvement was a huge improvement on the previous station. And Chief had so many innovative ideas coming into this station that it wasn't really hard for us to kind of build off of his enthusiasm and get the ball rolling a little bit further. Ron is such a strong advocate for safety and investing in community and uh, as well as I think mentoring and bringing up younger fire people to really understand the importance of the career in being a firefighter and a first responder. In, in putting together the team for this, um, one of the critical components was is having a good owner's representative. Having some board members that are in the construction industry really helped it out because they knew how to talk the language of the construction folks. And when we had our architect team, both Bill and John and Brian, they're experts in their field, but I had to be able to communicate fire language into construction language and design language so that we shared the same visual picture and then they in turn put that down on paper. So we really had to make an effort to have good communication. Even if you have expertise on your board, you're, um, you still ought to look at a professional to help you. We all were wise enough to know that we don't have the time to manage, you know, because there's a lot of details day to day. And so we hired a construction manager and we got a, a real good one. And uh, Brian Tate did an outstanding job. Well, I think part of uh, my role here was I, we have built other fire stations, so we had that experience. Uh, we selected an architect that had built other fire stations, and we'd selected a contractor that had built other fire stations. And so I think um, that was a great uh, foundation, if you will, uh, baseline for us to uh, succeed here. Yeah, we, uh, you know, we had the pleasure of working with a gentleman named Brian Harris uh, with TCA Architects out of Seattle. We'd worked with Brian before on another fire station for the city of Bozeman. 
And uh, he and the chief uh, got into a discussion early on in the project about a model that was used in Australia for fire station design, which basically had the separation of the contaminated environment uh, from the living environment. And that became uh, the thesis, if you will, for the design and uh, really became uh, a, a how we structured and organized the program. The key thing we do is to listen to the needs of the client and often without the benefit of really uh, taking a deep dive into the, the core values of, of a project because every project is unique, uh, you know, that, that's step one. And so uh, collaborating with the uh, Central Valley Fire District, uh, they had very specific uh, expectations and uh, desires for a project. When we designed this facility, we talked about it. We, help them understand the why again. Why are we building it this way? Because a lot of these ideas were firefighter driven and with their ideas incorporated, now they have ownership into this facility as well. So when he comes to us, he's you know, asking you are on the ground, you're the ones doing this day in and day out, what can we do to make this station better for you? And that boiled down all the way to the colors of the walls and the floor uh, the types of materials. Some of the things that we were really, really interested in were obviously the decon safety, wellness of the entire decon process. In addition to um, the crew space, we really wanted a place that, that built camaraderie. We wanted a, a, an area that we could spend around each other and instead of hiding in our rooms and things like that. And as well as the other things, of course, we wanted a really good gym. We wanted a great bay. We wanted comfortable bedrooms. We wanted more bathrooms than we had previously and, and a better office space that we could work in. And those were kind of the must-haves and then we sort of wanted just a better space to hang out in. And he was with us asking us questions every step of the way as, you know, the inside finishes, the outside, how's it going to look? Um, letting us vote on signs out front that the public are going to see and what we like and you know, what are we and our families going to be proud of. So we've approached everything we do here to try to paint the big picture, the big vision, and then approach all those that are part of that. Can you contribute to this overall project to make it a win-win for everybody? And we're really grateful that everybody bought into that vision with their ideas incorporated, now they have ownership into this facility as well. Yeah, uh, so the project duration from uh, conception to occupancy was about two years. Uh, it was about a year for the design process and taking the conception to uh, the reality of the design and then uh, about a year for uh, construction from that design effort to uh, the physical building. We're very familiar with all of those construction styles, so I wouldn't say that any of the challenges were out of just the ordinary construction world, just the stuff we deal with every day. Um, bringing those materials together presents a challenge, but it was all heavily detailed out by Think One Architecture. There was a lot of pre-planning that went into this building. They had a consultant that helped with this that specializes in fire stations. I think that was to our advantage. So even if it was kind of new to us, it wasn't necessarily new to the design team. We take the um International Building Code, of course, for a project like this, and, and that already has built into it a lot of uh, critical design attributes that a um, life safety type structure would expect in it. And then, of course, with inspections. Uh, for example, in this project, we had a situation where um, the, the strength of the structural concrete of the foundation uh, did not meet specifications. Uh, because of this being a mission critical, uh, facility in a high seismic zone. Uh, we took a hard look at that and actually demolished the portions of those foundations that were not up to spec, tore them out and did it again. And so uh, it's an example, uh, while uh, awkward in, in the moment, that uh, we just were not going to compromise on. In a nutshell, the, the most important uh, hierarchy was to uh, again, create an environment where the, the worst of the contaminants that the fighter fighters deal with are removed from their living environment. And uh, that led to the construction, design and construction of a separate decontamination building. But it also led to the organization of the plan to uh, create airlocks and, and spaces for firefighters to enter living quarters without 
uh, bringing in the contaminants that are otherwise associated with the, uh, you know, their work. There is the uh, quick action doors, notification system. Uh, there is thoughtful uh, design of how uh, people move through the building and getting from point A to B quickly, whether it's from their living quarters to the apparatus bay or uh, anything in between. And so there are some obvious attributes to a project like this and there are some subtle ones as well. And all of these things are just multiple levels of security to improve that living environment. Obviously we have more calls during the daytime than we do nighttime and then certain peaks of time. So we actually built the station around quick access to the bay. Knowing that they're going to be spending time in offices and doing trainings, things like that, we put the areas that they need to be closest to the apparatus bay close to the apparatus bay. So during the day, if we get a call that comes in, they can be immediately on the trucks and out the door. We made sure we didn't have any steps or trip hazards, fall hazards and that. We designed the grates for the floors to go under the trucks instead of between the trucks. We made sure we had enough space between the trucks so that we could adequately get your gear on quickly and move and not have that be a problem. The doors that we put in are bifold doors that open sideways in four seconds versus roll-up doors that take 12 to 15 seconds to open up. Not only does it give us a quick response out, but then they close automatically behind us. So we're not wasting time getting doors closed and we're not losing heat in the winter time. The design of that again was is to just have a quick, quick flow, a easy going flow of movement towards the apparatus to get out the door quickly. From there, when we're out on the fire ground, we start cleaning up and we're doing, picking up the hose, so on like that. We really don't want to remove our PPE too soon. I know it's hot, I know it's sweaty, uncomfortable, but we want to keep that in place as long as we can, just again to mitigate some of that exposure. But when it does finally come time to break down, our folks will take their gear, they just strip it right off and put it into a black garbage sack and bag it up that way. And then we have wipes on the trucks to where they wipe off hands, face, groins, all the area that is subjected to quick absorption and try to clean up that. Again, it's thinking where do we break that chain of contamination? We pick up our hoses, we pick up our bag gear and so on, the breathing apparatus. None of that dirty stuff goes into the cab of the truck. It's all bagged or compartmentalized in a truck and taken back to our decon facility. There they'll put on latex gloves, we'll get all the equipment cleaned, the bottles refilled, and only clean stuff goes back into service on the truck. Once they have gotten all the equipment washed clean, then they wash the hoses, then they wash the truck, everything's cleaned in the bay, and the final step is, is they take off the uniforms, put them into the wash machine, and take a steam shower. Shower within an hour is our saying. And what we want to do with the steam showers is, is to actually open up their pores and allow kind of the off-gassing of any contaminants that have been absorbed into the skin. I think back in days where I would take a shower four or five days after the fire that I was on, even though having showered every day, I was still getting smells of smoke coming off my body four and five days later. That's what we want to avoid. That's trapped contaminants that lead to cancer. In our particular case with this design of the decon building though, we don't want to just flush it down the drain and expect it to go away, we, we realize there are contaminants there. So we actually have holding tanks for these materials. If in fact we knew that we got into something really bad, those holding tanks can be separated off and held and pumped out. So bunker gear is obviously contaminant laden. So our process is, is anytime they've been in the black, they come back, they wash their bunker it's hung up to dry, and then it's moved into a special storage room that has a negative airflow. So it's always pulling air from the bay through the bunker room and outside. With that, we never have that real sooty smell when you walk into that room. It's also a dark environment, so we don't have daylight UV light breaking down the fibers of the bunker gear. It's well lit from 
lighting that uh, doesn't produce UV light. I know we can never be totally free of contaminants, but what can we do to put some good roadblocks there or break that chain? So it starts out with the decon building, but from there they come back in and we put in a boot washing station because a lot of times they may be going on a medical call or an accident scene and they have oil or grime or biohazards on the bottom of their boots. And instead of wearing those boots into the fire station and spreading that all around, but we also have the little rubber shoes and they keep those outside in the bay to where they'll take their work boots off to go into the living area. And that again is keeping the contaminants, dirt out in the bay and the living areas clean. And all of these things are just multiple levels of security to improve that living environment, to minimize the amount of contaminants that are brought into the building. The living space and the administrative office space is positive pressure. And so it's fresh air from the outside coming in here, positive pressure, and then the airflow goes out to the bays. So anytime the bay doors are opened, none of that dirtier air from diesel smoke or anything else can come back into the living quarters. Um, you'll notice there's a lot of hard surfaces. All the floors are hard surfaces so that uh, they're, one, easy to clean, but also that uh, you know, you can, uh, we have walk-off mats at doors where you're trying to um, be a first line of defense for contaminants that are brought into the facility. Another aspect that we incorporated into this facility was multi-purpose usage of our training room. So we recognize that there could be some very large events that are emergency in nature, whether it could be a large train crash um, with Balkan oil field coming through here, a lot of flammable liquids on the railroad, maybe a plane crash at the airport. God forbid we don't want that, but that's always a possibility. Or any number of natural disasters. But to do effective management of those means that you have to put together an incident command team. And that incident command team needs to have a good place to work. Uh, we're sitting in a room right now that is intended to be an emergency command center uh, for a regional use. And so there may be multi-agency uh, departments that are operating out of this particular building because we've built it to uh, a standard that is in excess of normal construction, uh, commercial construction projects. So uh, whether it's uh, structural redundancies, uh, the inspections that went into it, and just an enhanced level of quality uh, is another example of what makes this project really important. So when we built it in, we did all the cabling, power supplies, heavy duty Wi-Fi, everything infrastructure wise so that we could set that up as a large incident command center that had individual computers, telephones, connections to printers, connections to TV for news feeds, live feeds, and, and really operate to have anywhere from 15 to 20 incident command role functions being filled. Even with having eight bedrooms with three bed, beds in each bedroom, um, in a emergency state, we could have more than one person in each bedroom with three separate beds. So we could effectively house 24 people around the clock. Our sleeping arrangements would be such to handle that. The bathroom facilities are in place to handle that. Since I uh, mentioned that uh, we're close to the airport and close to a railroad tracks, it impacts a lot of the firefighters' ability to sleep. So there's acoustical control at all the uh, sleeping, uh, sleeping rooms. Uh, there is uh, um, triple glazed windows and a high performance building envelope around the sleeping rooms to mitigate uh, the amount of uh, you know, distraction from a, a good night's sleep. We have a separate heating and cooling system for them uh, and gives them individual controls for their heating and cooling um, and separation of the living quarters from even the office areas to minimize any cross contamination or uh, connection there. So we designed the bedrooms to where we had enough bedrooms to have the on-duty crew be able to have their own bedroom. So now every firefighter assigned to the station is able to have their own bed, their own bookcase that they can put their family pictures on and gives them a sense of place because they're spending a third of their life in a fire station. So we, we want to create that home environment as best as we can. Uh, the workout area was designed to be away from the sleeping rooms, primarily because some guys like to get up at 5 in the morning and get their workout in. 
or do it late at night. And we don't want the sound of the weights being transmitted through the cement floors or things like that. So it's on the other side of the bay. But again, they spend an hour a shift every time they're on duty out there. And so it's close to the bay again for that quick response. Everything fits. We have the opportunity to have the decon bay, um, but we also have a gym where we can work out at. We have room, um, like it's a priority to do physical fitness every day. Um, being able to sleep away from everything else so in the morning, um, when I get up earlier and I'm making coffee, I'm not waking up the captain. I really love the, uh, like the firefighter work area. You know, I, I love where we can all have a space. The captain's office is right there. We have more space to kind of interact with each other. It's a good chance for us to kind of push each other and learn new topics and have our meetings that were in our own little spot. And before we were kind of crammed into a little tiny, tiny half of a bedroom and we'd all, you know, sometimes six or seven or eight of us be in there having a conversation. So it's nice to have our own space now to sort of orient our thoughts for the day. Everyone's very proud of it and everyone loves to bring their family here. Their kids are just in awe. They get to see the signs out front and these giant red doors. Uh, they got the apparatus parked inside, so everyone's loving to bring their kids and their family here. And you're just, you're really proud of your station. I mean, our job is still the same. Day to day, we're still doing the same thing. We still take the same pride in the things that we do. For us, it's a little more pride in our station. I think it's fun for us to bring our wives in here. It's fun for us to bring our parents in here. It's, so that pride that's kind of instilled with the new station, although it seems like it's silly, it's an inanimate object, it's our building, it's our place, it's kind of our identity. And it's become that for us, so, so we're really happy about that. I mean, the, everything we do from day to day hasn't changed at all. But as far as our, our pride in the actual station, we're, we're all happy to have it, and, and we feel like it's a, a great reflection of who we are as a department. Well, I think the one thing, uh, uh, an additional element that is totally separate from the, you know, the issues that we dealt with from a design standpoint for the firefighters was the importance of this facility to the community. The fact that this building is going to become a landmark gateway building for the uh, community of Belgrade. And that was extremely important that this building speak to the civic nature of it and it's a reflection of the community and um, the positive growth that this community is headed towards. And I think that was extremely important and I think that as a team, uh, we were able to uh, accomplish that. Yeah, I think, uh, of course, we're grateful for a project like this being funded by the taxpayers, right? The residents of a project like this, uh, this is their building. And so we're again sitting in a room right now that is intended for multi-use, where folks that, um, taxpayers or the community can uh, come and uh, use this facility for their benefit. But of course, um, it becomes an anchor for the community as well, located um, in areas that are intended for growth and accessible to the public and its adjacencies to the airport have obvious value as well. And so we really encourage the, the public to come use their building. Having those big open glass doors where the public can see our apparatus, they can see us in there working on our apparatus, doing daily checks, um, knowing that their taxpayer dollars are getting taken care of, you know, trusting that every cent that they're spending is, is allocated wisely and it's not just thought of as a piece of equipment or a truck. It's, this is your equipment and this is your tools and we're gonna take care of them, we're gonna make them last 20 years. This is gonna make us safer in the long run. Maybe it is an extra thing and to wash your boots or wash your hands or um, completely um, strip down all your gear, throw it in the washer instead of just putting it back on the rack. But it keeps it cleaner. I mean, it's better for us to breathe. This department was very um, you know, proactive rather than reactive. You know, they looked at what we do on a daily basis and realized the fire service is a 20 to 30 year career and figured out ways that when we're done here, we can have the retirement we want. And at the end of the day, like, I mean, the goal is to have a good career and have a, have a life after our career as well and not be sick. So I think those extra steps, they're not, I don't see them as a burden. I think they're just precautionary for a better life.